You're live on SABC News Channel 404 with me, Sakina Kamwendo. A warm welcome to one of your favorite weekly review analysis programs, Media Monitor. And this is what we have lined up for you this hour. We'll take a look at the media coverage of the fiercely contested ANC December elective conference. We'll also unpack how social media has assisted singer and former ANC MP Jennifer Ferguson in speaking out about her rape claim against Safa boss Danny Jordan. And later on, we'll delve into the election aftermath in both Kenya and Liberia. But before we unpack these stories, let's first take a look at the news in brief this hour. Veteran journalist Jacques Poe's explosive new book has quickly moved to the international bestsellers list and bookstores around South Africa sold out within a matter of hours on Friday after the state security agency ordered NB publishers to seize and desist from selling and or printing any more copies of the book. The president's keepers uh, detailed startling allegations of corruption and criminal networks centered around President Jacob Zuma. The South African Revenue Service has also threatened legal action against POW. Advocacy groups, although, have come out in POW's defense. Bookshops have been inundated. Copies flew off the shelves since the SSA's order Friday afternoon to recall the book. This buyer was lucky to get his pre-ordered copy. So I actually wanted to see what the fuss is about, and that's the main reason why I'm buying it, to see for myself what is the information in the book. Many others had to leave empty-handed. They're saying they're sold out currently in the waiting stock. Bookshops say copies sold out in a matter of hours. 30 copies all gone. Hoping to get some more, but we're not too sure of how things are going to proceed. A pirated, hacked copy is circulating on social media. NB publishers say more copies are being printed to meet the overwhelming demand. In the meantime, it's urging people to buy an e-book version on Amazon. Interest in the book has seen it rocketing onto Amazon's international bestsellers list. By late afternoon, it ranked the ninth bestseller on Kindle. As the SSA's next move is awaited, more condemnation of what's been described as draconian measures. They are making a demand uh, to take the book off the shelves in a manner that is reminiscent of the worst days of apartheid. Um, instead of actually going to the bottom of whether the story is true or not. Others believe it borders on censorship. So it really is, I think, should be a cause for concern that this is a part of a slippery slope uh, towards increasing repression and increasing clampdown on freedom of expression, particularly when it comes to issues that pointing to corruption and state capture involving those holding higher office. Both NB publishers and the SSA have refused to comment any further on the matter for now. Lukaino Kalada, SABC News, Parliament. Fearing a U.S. backlash, South African banks still refuse to do business in Cuba. Now, the country's ambassador to South Africa told a commemoration of the late Fidel Castro that some major businesses are still reluctant to invest due to Washington's sanctions. Former President Halima Mutlante joined calls for businesses to support the struggling nation. The historic Lilies Farm, a fitting venue to commemorate the life of a revolutionary. Castro played a pivotal role against colonialism in Africa and in the defeat of apartheid. But South Africa is not giving back. There are banks in South Africa that refuse to do business in Cuba because they feel their interests could be damaged in the United States. And in some cases they can. Some cases the the political arm of the United States is so long that it's able to impact in the jurisdiction, which is a sovereign territory of another country. Former Intelligence Minister Ronnie Casserole criticized Pretoria for failing to support the people of Cuba while billions were being lost through corruption. In this wealthy country, with these corporates in this country that hide, invisibly hide, billions and billions, not even to invest in our own economy, and send the billions away, including the Gupta Zuma theft of this country. Motlante urged for the mobilization of resources to help the Cubans. If we could get uh, some of our financial institutions here to be prepared to uh, underwrite 
these investments in Cuba by the African companies were that in itself were, you know, on, on, on favorable terms, long term, uh, as it were, would, would, would help. The late Cuban leader was hailed for his role in developing education in his country with little resources. Muntlengeni Dipoku, SABC News, Johannesburg. Polokwane City and Bidvest Vis booked their places in the semi-finals of the Telkom knockout last night, joining Bloemfontein Celtic, who had booked their place in the last four earlier yesterday. The final place will be decided later today when Kaiser Chiefs take on Chipa United. In last night's action, however, Polokwane has uh, caused a major upset when they beat Orlando Pirates on penalties at the Orlando Stadium, and Vitz advanced with a 1-0 over Baroka at the Bidvest First Stadium. And here are some of the highlights from those games in the first round of the cup but uh, on Wednesday night missed a myriad of chances which might well have uh, turned the game around this is another good run from Ramagarena gets past Sandy Lands what a goal brilliantly done and goal with a finishing touch Here from Villa Kazi Nakabusa and a slip at the back and an equaliser defensive error is punished is too strong Great pass from Maloleke, it's 2-1. Tonight on your World of Champions, don't forget the Champions League final, the African Champions League for Morocco. Chacha, goal! to take the fourth kick for Pirates. Nyauza, he's missed! So, Paul Aquani City will win this game if they convert. This is a very short little run-up. Can he score? They are into the semi-finals. Polo Kwani City have come to the Orlando Stadium and upset the Buccaneers. Started playing from junior level at Alexandra. From under 12 level for Alexandra United Brothers. And he moved on to play for Alexandra United. Temisa Classic, all of those teams followed in. A chance coming in! And it's a stone poke into the back of the net. Well, remind me to tell you a joke about Orlando Pirates later on, uh, but after the break, we'll take a look at the Sunday papers, so do stay tuned. He'll have his regular. I'll have a new flying fish chill, please. What you got there? It's a new light flying fish. It's got 35% less calories than your regular. Try one. Thanks. That is light. Yeah. Don't let your regular weigh you down. Try new flying fish chill. And welcome back to Media Monitor. Well, our guests on the panel today, we welcome media analyst Melo Majolejo and William Bird, as well as uh, SABC uh, foreign editor Sophie Mokwena. Good morning and welcome. And of course, William will be joining us slightly later on. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, the Sunday papers right now, just to see who's leading with what. Well, the Sunday Times, uh, their lead this morning, developments on last week's story about a self-confessed tobacco smuggler, Adriano Mazzotti, who has emerged as a contributor to Nkosa Zana Dlamini Zuma's presidential bid. Now, the article shows images from Mazzotti's Instagram account of him and some of his business associ associates and that they've met with the presidential hopeful more than once. The City Press today, their lead is the nuclear deal on the front page of the City Press this morning. And insiders at the Department of Minerals and Energy say that Minister David Matlobo is forcing his nuclear power plants into action. Officials at the department are working weekends to finalize the country's uh, reviewed international integrated energy resource plan. And that is four months ahead of schedule. 
The Sunday Independent, uh, the Sunday Indy this morning leading with a story about big coal mining companies which entered into long-term apartheid era contracts with power utility Eskom. They may face the prospect of hefty fines amounting to billions of rands if the contracts are found to be in contravention of the Competition Act 89 of 1998. The Sunday Tribune, they leading with a story about divisions in the rugby fraternity. Now, local rugby personalities have criticized the decision to play the 2023 Rugby World Cup matches at the Moses Mabida Stadium. The weekend, August, lastly, uh, the August leading with the author of The President's Keepers, Jacques Poe, saying that he's well prepared and not at all phased uh, because uh, they will not succeed. And this comes after the state security agency has moved to silence him and to stop further distribution of the book. But right now, we shift our focus to a quick update on most of the trending stories on social media this past week. And we're joined by Tsepiso Moche to tell us uh, what it is that people are talking about. Please take us through it, Tsepiso. Good morning, Sakina. Sakina, the biggest hashtag for this week was on Monday, um, uh, the, the Black Monday. Now, Sakina, on Monday, thousands and thousands of um, farmers took to the streets to protest against what they call uh, murders against the farmers. Now, as you can see, Sakina, on the screen, um, there are... Uh, the, there's a state flags. Yes, and that was met with harsh criticism from different people saying um, this is not in any way um, uh, promoting uh, uh, co cohesion in the country, saying... Um, Let's see what they're saying about that. The first tweet is from Julius Malema saying, white farmers are blocking the roads illegally and police are not, are not shooting rubber bullets. But if it was a black youth, yo, at uh, Figilam Balula. And Sunas Ten says, how many times have black people said enough is enough with racism? And the last one is from Ed the Black Protector saying, as black people, we can't unite over our common grievances. Um, if we had our own Black Monday, people would come there wearing ANC and some EFF t-shirts. Sophie and Melo? What's your take on that? So well, I think uh, that was very wrong for those who were protesting to hoist the old flag. When you look at what's happening in Germany, you cannot use a Nazi flag. You get punished heavily so. Because when you look at the history of what transpired when that kind of a flag was used, it was divisive. And many people died in honor of that flag. And I think that was a mistake that was done by those who carried that flag. And I think. Uh, the Minister of Defense has commented, the Deputy President has commented, and the entire country. And Malema even saying, if there was to be another match, they'll take them head on. Indeed, I think it actually took away from that cause rather than, you know, highlight the plight that they were seeking to. But uh, moving on, uh, what was the other big story this week? Um, another uh, second hashtag, Sakina, is the Christopher Panayotu. Now, this comes after the, the judgment was delivered in, in the Western Cape, um, convicting uh, Panayotu of, kill, of uh, taking part in the murder of uh, his wife. And now, what were people Sakina, saying? Sakina, many people took to Twitter to congratulate um, the judge for delivering um, what they term as brilliant judgment. Means here a refueler saying Christopher Panayotu found guilty. Best news of the week. Finally, some justice for Jade. At Andre underscore CT says rot in jail, Christopher Panayotu. And our last one is from Ed Pusisi Park saying finally justice has been served. Christopher Panayotu found guilty of murdering his wife. And of course, the other big one, uh, The President's Keepers, that book by uh, Jacques Poe. I went, incidentally, to uh, exclusive books yesterday just to check and sold out completely. So what did people say about this one? Sakina, many people took to Twitter to um, criticize the, the state security agency um, for what um, they have uh, done issuing that statement on Friday. Here, rights to know says uh, um, state, state, South Af state uh, security agency's legal threat is a crude act of censorship aimed to intimidate journalists and protect the corrupt and powerful. Mrs. Berry saying, dear state security agency, you want the Zuma book recalled, we want the president recalled. Perhaps we should talk. Well, uh, our guests, uh, what's your take on that? Are we hopping back to the old days, Mela? Uh, I do not think so, because, I mean, somebody raised something very interesting on social media that why is it that in South Africa, journalists do not fear publishing such things about powerful people in the country? And then somebody said that the reason is because largely there hasn't been consequences when people publish such things. People aren't killed as in other countries like Brazil or Venezuela or so on. So I thought that was a very interesting perspective in terms of our freedom is sort of almost like buttressed on the notion that there isn't actually follow-up when such things are published. Sophie? My question is, 
where was the intelligence all the time when mm -hmm. the book was written? It speaks to the capacity of the intelligence services in South Africa. If there were issues to be raised, they could have done the intervention as early as possible, correct wherever uh, needs to be corrected information. The same with SARS. But secondly, as soon as uh, there was uh, a story around this book last week, uh, Sunday, why wait until Friday this week? I mean, the Isn't intelligence it a criminal act to must act to, to actually deny or uh, to acknowledge that you are actually part of the intelligence network? You're not allowed to do that, are you? I think the problem is our intelligence services sometimes, I don't know how they operate. It, it's like somebody has to tell them you have to do this. They were under pressure from somewhere. The reality is they could have uh, asked questions to the publisher but also the author at the right time to avoid perhaps uh, going to print with wrong information if it is so. But I'm saying, why now? And unfortunately, it was a marketing tool for the book and it has gone viral not local, but international. I think we'll, we will incorporate more aspects of that book as we unpack some of the other stories. Uh, Tepiso, thanks to you. And of course, uh, we'll unpack the media coverage on the ANC elective conference candidates when we come back. So don't go away. Well, a very good morning and welcome to AM News Live at 1000 hours across all Central Africa regions. A fitting send-off for a revolutionary giant, a life dedicated in service of the people. The result means that uh, Swallows are out of the ABC Multiple League and drop uh, to the amateur fourth tire of South African football, the SAB League. Tune in on AM News every Saturday and Sunday from 10 hours. And this is, of course, Media Monitor on News Channel here at the SABC 404. And uh, right now, unpacking some of the other big stories. And it's just over a month before the ANC's highly anticipated elective conference. But uh, as uh, to who will emerge, the new leader remains, of course, anyone's guess. And while branches are still busy with the nominations process, and lobbying is, of course, continuing for several of the party's seven candidates, uh, polls have gone on overdrive, punting names, while some different media organizations covering the presidential race have also already nailed their colors to the mask. So let's look at the race itself and how it has been covered by the various media houses, including the social media aspect of that. So Sophie, let me start with you. As the SABC, let's start in-house. How have we covered this particular story? Well, we have tried to cover the story. I guess uh, it's up to the public to give us, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the results or a verdict but the reality is we are going to kind of improve our coverage starting from tomorrow on morning life and going forward we'll have special projects looking at different issues not only in terms of the contestation in terms of the positions but looking also the documents that are supposed to be ratified by conference you are aware that uh, six months ago they had a policy conference and those documents must be approved by the conference and we'll look at the uh, policy conf uh, the documents but also look at the way forward after the uh, person who has won has won and to see what kind of ANC are we going to have but also how will it impact on the country at large well and I think we have tried but we are going to can improve. we tell can we tell what of a uh, type of ANC we're gonna have is it gonna be any different regardless of who emerges as the leader but also Melo mm -hmm. uh, the we've said you know some of the media houses have already nailed their colors to the mask mm -hmm. you know punting a certain candidate mm -hmm. over others so how can media lobbying actually influence the election of a particular candidate I think that's a, <coughs> a very important excuse me <coughs> It's a very important issue that you're raising there. Because, for example, if you look within the list of candidates, 
There's some candidates that are seem to be more sympathetic towards business and so on, and those candidates would be maybe Yusel Ramaphosa's and Yusel Mkhizes, and there are those other candidates who are Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma who seem to be more pro populist radical change within the country. So I think within that space, given the fact that like big corporates uh, have a large influence over media houses in terms of advertising and so on, you'd find that filtering through in terms of the candidates that they're backing. So if you go into newspapers, for example, the various publications that we have, you'd find them that there's continually stories about, for example, Cyril Ramaphosa being punted in the media and so on. Of course, Ngozana Dlamini Zuma does get a bit of exposure every now and again, but then obviously her agenda that she's present, she's campaigning on, seems to be sort of contrary to what they advocate. So let's not speak in parables. What are you saying, Melo? Who's doing what? No, I'm saying the media, <laughs> in terms of support, they seem to be more pro Cyril, and the other uh, candidate in terms of Ngozana Dlamini Zuma, she seems to not be getting as much coverage there. So, but then that's very interesting now because the media, who reads the media, is it necessarily the branch delegates that are going to be voting at the conference? So there might actually be a disjuncture between what the media is projecting and what is actually happening on the ground in terms of branch processes. And of course we can go on and on on that score, but Sophie, there are concerns that this Congress may not get off the ground mm -hmm. for starters, and if it does, it actually may not sit, it may not come uh, it actually may not conclude. Mm -hmm. So what are your sentiments? What, what, what do you sense? Because you going around the country, what is it looking like on the ground? Well, indeed, ANC is at the crossroads, but the reality is uh, the ANC will have to emerge as uh, an exemplary party that has mm -hmm. uh, been there for quite a long time on the continent and around the world. And it's up to the current leadership that is charged with responsibility to organize the conference to ensure that it does take place and indeed elections happen but also they adopt policies that will take the country forward or in terms of what ANC wants to see happening in the country but the reality is I have spoken to some somebody said to me it's unlikely that the conference will happen and uh, because there are two issues at play one is that ANC finds itself very divided Secondly, in terms of the candidates, people are not yet convinced who should really take leadership role in terms of taking the ANC to the 2019 elections. Because when you look at different candidates, there are problems. But I think the ANC currently, particularly the NEC, is working very hard to ensure that the conference go ahead. But it will be a big test for President Jacob Zuma if the conference doesn't take place it will be an indictment on his leadership. What mm. do you make of that? What happens? Who stands to gain more if this conference actually doesn't get a, uh, going mm -hmm. or if it doesn't conclude? And also, have we fallen into the trap that they uh, fell into in the United States, mm -hmm. whereby you had the media punting Hillary Clinton ad nauseum mm -hmm. and uh, building up that expectation mm -hmm. only to find that Trump won? Uh, what's your take on that? I think for me, the chances that uh, conference doesn't happen from my perspective where I'm sitting, they don't seem to be very th that high. And the reason I'd say that is that there is no uh, benefit to the people currently within the ANC for them to postpone this thing any longer. Because then the one issue that had come up repeatedly is why hasn't the N ANC NEC voted Jacob Zuma out? Why do they still uh, keep him there as president even though he has all of these issues which everybody seems to be in consensus with that actually no, you cannot have a president of a country being surrounded with such issues. And then for me, the argument that has been put, put forward and that I agree with is that they're waiting for the conference to happen such that there can be a leadership change. And the reason is that because there's different factions within the ANC itself that want different leaders. They may be agreed on the fact that they want Jacob Zuma out, but they're not agreed on who they want to take over. So the conference is sort of like a mechanism for them to assert their power using their influence the branches and I think everybody actually wants that to happen sooner rather than later but in terms of uh, the media coverage punting a certain candidate have we learned any lessons there I don't think so because I think ultimately interest tend to trump uh, to excuse the pun, tend to trump common sense in that sense, right? Because people want their candidate, regardless of whether or not that is having an effect or not, people will still trump their candidate. They'll say, no, Sir Ramaphosa is the best candidate and so on. I mean, if you look at that structure in terms of the issues that we have in the country, what is any of the candidates proposing to fix the issues that we have? It's just becoming a personality contest where people just want somebody to guard their own vested interest. And I feel that the country is at a point now where we need some sort of 
change. But Sophie, can they realistically propose any material change as candidates? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it is ANC policy mm -hmm. that they will have to implement. It, it, it's not about their own win, uh, own. You are correct. You are correct, Sakita. And when you look at what transpired at the policy conference, we mm -hmm. fairly know the direction the ANC wants to take. As a leader, you have to implement mm -hmm. the policies of the ANC. Yes, you can make uh, interventions here and there where there are challenges, mm -hmm. but you can't do a uh, overhaul of policy direction when after you are elected. Therefore, whether it's Dr. Nkwasa Zanatlamini Zuma, Cyril Ramaphosa, Lindue Sisulu, Zueli Mkise, Matthew Posa, mm -hmm. Jeff Hatebe, or anyone who might emerge at the conference floor. Because one thing that we f tend to forget is that at the conference, you can still nominate from the floor. Any name can mm -hmm. emerge. And whoever will get a, a two-thirds in terms of uh, uh, support at the conference level, you can be in the ballot. Therefore, anything can happen. But the reality is the ANC policy conference has given direction in terms of the direction the party wants to take. And now this conference is going to ratify those documents. They'll make changes here and there. And the leader or the collective leadership, the NEC that will be elected at that conference, the top six that is going to be elected there, is going to implement that those uh, policy documents. Therefore, whoever comes, it's going to be business as usual. Just one more comment there. I think for me, I agree absolutely th that's one thing that people miss, that there's a certain policy continuity within the ANC. But the one thing that does change is the particular implementation. Because if you read those ANC policies, it's very high language, very abstract. And to actually give substance and flesh to those things, that's where the elected leadership makes a difference. And I think a good example of that would be, for example, with Mbeki and the gear strategy. I mean, people would be arguing that, no, the country had decided that it's going to follow these policies. But then Mbeki and Trevor Manuel got to the union building, and all of a sudden, gear became policy of I, the I want to disagree. You know what, Sakina. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to disagree about Mbeki and Tulokwane and those back, policies. We not are today, back Sophie. where the SACP not now, not now. <laughs> they are not happy. We, we will try and create space for that because it is a very important and very interesting <laughs> argument, especially given the economy of the mm. country that is flailing. But for now, um, you know, we'll come back to the gender agenda mm -hmm. as part of this particular race because after the break, we'll look at Safa boss Danny Yordan denying rape allegations leveled against him by former ANC member of parliament two weeks ago and he of course is himself an AMP ANC member. Today on Rights and Recourse we will unpack the new traditional court bill. The idea of the bill is not to overregulate, uh, to basically set the principles. The most important aspect of this bill is that it understands that customary law by its nature is consensual, that I have a right to affiliate, I have a right therefore to opt in, and I have a right to opt out. The opt out provision is, is basically one that you've got to respect the court in, in the sense of if you've been summonsed, you've got to tell the, the clerk of the court at least that you're not willing to attend. The challenge that I would like to throw to the Department of Justice it has to ensure, come up with mechanisms of ensuring that people who exercise their right to opt out or to opt in are not in any way victimized. Hashtag rights with Dumila Mates on legal issues every Sunday at 2 o'clock Central African time. South African Football Association boss uh, Danny Yordan has flatly denied allegations by singer and former ANC member of parliament Jennifer Ferguson that he raped her back in 1993. This after Ferguson disclosed on social media about two weeks ago that Yordan attacked her in a hotel room in Port Elizabeth. In a statement released through his lawyers on Wednesday, the embattled Yordan said that he'd been keeping quiet on the matter because of empathy for victims of gender-based violence. However, Yordan, who's been advised by his lawyers lawyers not to speak publicly on the matter, says that he would welcome a criminal case over the allegations. We are joined on the line now by your dance accuser, Jennifer Ferguson, who is now based in Sweden, where she is speaking to us from for more details on this incident. Jennifer, good morning and welcome to Media Monitor. Good morning, my dear. Thank you. 
So after 24 long years, why did you finally decide to speak up now? Well, it's a, it's a very pertinent question. I do it now because I couldn't before. I do it now because I'm ready. I do it now because there comes a time when you have to deal with the shame. I do it now because I join with the voices of millions of other women speaking out from the sorrow of shame that's kept their violation hidden, often for a lifetime. I do it now because I have nothing to lose. I do it now because I feel lighter and stronger for it. And I do it now because our country is being strangled by men in power who lie and abuse and violate without recourse. And women in power are too often protecting them. I do it now because I'm not alone. I've got my family standing with me. I've got a sisterhood that is helping a brave and vocal community. I do it now because I can own my story, free from a wall of highly paid lawyers behind whom I'm hiding. I do it now because I've got a voice and privilege that gives me the platform to speak up for thousands of women and children, and even some men who have suffered the humiliation of rape and have neither voice or platform. And I do it now because maybe it will make you brave enough to come out and speak your truth. So you speak about the difficulty of speaking out against powerful men, Jennifer. Danny O'Don is indeed a powerful man, a global football figure. Um, and so to speak, um, he is a global, fo a global football figure, so to speak. Weren't you discouraged by that, uh, that you wouldn't well, perhaps be believed? I can tell you now, when I, when I came out with my story, I, it was done without any sense of calculation. And in fact, a week after the story had broken and this media frenzy and all the rest, I actually had to Google just who Danny Yordan was. I knew that he was high up in FIFA or whatever. But I mean, I, he hasn't been part of my... I haven't, you know, <laughs> I haven't been disseminating him. And now, of course, I understand much more how much he has to lose and I understand also why he pulls a, a wall of law of lawyers around him, and that in my mind, he, and to many, many, many of us, we feel he's still in hiding. You know, he comes out with a legal statement, uh, um, a woman who's presenting it on behalf of him, but as yet, I haven't been able to see him come out and take ownership of his story. Now that Danny has denied that he raped you, how does that make you feel? Has it rubbed salt into the wounds? I mean, we've given Danny a, a very, I'd say, a highly civilized and evolved opportunity that is born out of our country's history, our journey with dealing with atrocities of the past. We, we gave the opportunity for mediation, for conversations that could create the space for, for healing as we meet each other as fellow human beings. We would take ownership of wrongdoing. We ask for forgiveness, we apologize, and we extend forgiveness. That is what South Africa's, you know, we can be proud of our history around that. That they belittled this offer for a restorative justice mediation process is, is unfortunate. And the tone in which they did it, manipulating it in a way that made it feel like they hold the higher moral ground because it's going to be for those in power. Danny, you're down the one in power. I'm not the one in power. So obviously their legal tactics is to try and sort of put up walls of law around that, that are protecting guilt. Because we don't, go to, we don't go to court to prove innocence. We go to court, as it stands now, to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt. That's how it works. And that's why we, as on, on behalf of, of many, many, many thousands of rape victims, when it comes to the court and the onus on the rape victim to prove guilt, it becomes a very onerous procedure and is prejudicial to women in that situation, children in that situation. So we try and find, we are committed to trying to find spaces where we can have conversations that are respectful and liberating to both parties. Jennifer, we thank you for your time this morning. And that was Jennifer Ferguson, accuser of uh, Danny Ordan, and she was speaking to us on the line from Sweden. It's 5 p.m. Central African time, broadcasting live from Johannesburg. This is VM News.
Mugabe is wanted in South Africa on a charge of assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm. Mugabe allegedly assaulted local model Gabriela Engels with an extension cord. If the minister has uh, granted the first lady diplomatic immunity, then it, it, it then means that she, she will not be prosecuted. There will now be 16 countries that form part of SEDEC. The Comoros was added as a member state during this summit. New Zealand rugby great Sir Colin Meads has passed away at the age of 81 following the battle with the pancreatic cancer. In 1999, Meads was named New Zealand's greatest rugby player of the 20th century. This year, a bronze statue of Meads was unveiled in his hometown of Tekuti. Stay tuned to PM News for all your news updates every Saturday and Sunday from 1500 hours. And we're back here on Media Monitor and uh, Sophie Mokwena and also Melo uh, Mokhalopo. Uh, we actually talking about Jennifer Ferguson and of course the various nuances contained in that particular story. Uh, so let's start here. Accusing very powerful men mm -hmm. of sexual assault. And it's a bit of a theme at the moment that's running through various uh, segments of society. In Hollywood, you have um, the Harvey Weinstein and now the Kevin Spacey situation. And you look at the UK MPs involved in various issues there. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, Jennifer Ferguson and three others accusing Danny Jordan mm -hmm. um, of, of course, uh, rape. So do you think that the politi political parties, do you think their response is adequate when it comes to how they deal with such allegations? I mean, obviously, it can never be adequate when you have in a country where 50% of the population is afraid to be moving about freely because of fear of rape and so on. So I don't think that can never, can never be said that they've done enough. I think there's a whole lot more to be done in terms of this issue. I think in terms of the narrative that obviously gets uh, tagged along with this issue, it's often that people do not get believed like women are just throwing uh, mud at people, trying to tarnish their reputations and so on. And that I think what that does is that it creates a disincentive in our public discourse for people to actually come out and say, you know what, I was raped, and then this is what happens. Because more often than not, the side that we choose is the side of the person that we used to, we become habituated to. And in this case, I suppose, Danny Jordan would be that person that we've seen as a public figure. I think another issue which often comes up is that, but this person is such a nice guy. I mean, he's done one, two, three, whatever. Surely it cannot be him that did all of these things. But then for me, the question is, but why do we need to reduce complex people to single issue people? I mean, why can't a person be a rapist and also do all of these other nice, uh, wonderful and constructive things which have actually benefited the country? So I think for me, the narrative in that sense, we also need to be able to see people for the complexity that they encapsulate. But also at the same time, we shouldn't marginalize people's voices by wanting to disbelieve them and so on. One last point, in terms of media coverage, I mean, one thing that I picked up during the week, especially with the ANC presidential candidates, is that they were being asked whether or not they believed Kwesi. So this is another story that has come up mm. now around issues of rape. So now, for me, that question is very problematic, right? Because now what you're sort of doing is sort of like you're running a straw poll to see whether or not that person's claims are valid, whether that person's voice is valid, and whether that person's voice is enough. And I think what that does unintentionally is that it delegitimizes people's voices because I have said, I've made the statement that I experienced this thing, and now all of a sudden now people must be asked politicians mm. whether or not they believe me. I totally agree with you because I think, Sophie, it places that abominable act of mm. rape and also the victim mm -hmm. at the periphery yes. of the actual matter. But shouldn't political parties be the ones, you know, setting the example right from the top? Mm -hmm. Because why are political parties not acting decisively when it comes to allegations? Rape is a very serious allegation. You had a British MP who uh, some people are saying he was fired or uh, just because he put his knee on someone's um, uh, hand on someone's mm -hmm. knee. Mm -hmm. But it's more than that. The party asked him quite specifically, will there be any more such revelations mm -hmm. coming out and he couldn't answer that question emphatically mm -hmm. and they sacked him why are we not seeing the same from political parties in south africa i'm very disappointed with all the political parties in this country because i don't understand why are they mum on this issue the ruling party where danny jordan comes from and he is loyal to the party I haven't had uh, a, a strong statement to ask hard questions. Not to say he's guilty, but ask hard questions. Secondly, we live in a very, very patriarchal society. Sakina, you know, 
South Africa has got a serious problem. But coming to the question whether women candidates cannot answer a question whether they believe crazy or not, I hold a complete different view. Any leader must be up to the task to answer any question. But I, I, I tend to agree with Mela on this one because why should you be polled on whether you agree or disagree mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to looking at perhaps the moral issue mm -hmm. that is contained in this. Mm -hmm. If you have a father mm -hmm. sleeping with someone viewed as his child, mm -hmm. isn't that a bigger issue? But That's of exactly how the, the, those women leaders should answer the question to say, mm -hmm. let's look at the bigger issue. But mm -hmm. to say, I can't answer this, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it, for me, it doesn't work. Any leader must be up to the task to answer any question and answer honestly. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be interesting to see whether these ANC uh, presidential candidates, the female candidates for that matter, actually do move that gender agenda mm -hmm. forward. Well, the Supreme Court will again be at the center of a legal battle over the presidency in Kenya. This after a Jubilee governing party filed a preemptive uh, petition seeking a declaration to uphold Uhuru Kenyatta's election that took place on the uh, 26th of October. That was, of course, a repeat election. Kenya, uh, Kenyatta won 98 percent of that vote in the rerun uh, with the turnout at just 39 percent less than half of uh, those recorded in the August vote and according to the National Election Commission economists are optimistic that Kenya's economy will weather this election storm uh, at least better better than it had a decade ago which saw uh, the bloodbath uh, in that election followed by economic growth plummeting to 0.2 percent in 2008 from 6.9 percent the year before mm -hmm. so a very interesting one that uh, Sophie you were in Kenya uh, and uh, just uh, picking up from there, 98% of 39% of the vote is what Uhuru Kenyatta uh, has to hold on to. Mm -hmm. So you have more than half of the country who either did not support him or did not come mm -hmm. out to register their opinion on this. So what was it like on the ground in Kenya? Well, the country is divided. It, the country is very divided. And unfortunately, it has even taken a tribal uh, division where people are rallying behind particular individuals based on their tribes or perhaps the group they belong to. And it is very dangerous. We know, you know, when I was there, I, 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 was, I was shocked and I had fears. I could see Rwanda almost unfolding when, you know, people are using tribalism to decide who should lead the country. It is very, very bad. But I think uh, the African Union will have to act. The international community must assist Kenya. All of us, we must assist Kenya. We don't want to see a situation that we saw in, in Rwanda in, two, in, in 1994. Interesting choice of words. They will have to act. Mm -hmm. Why haven't they acted, Melo? Considering that this election mm -hmm. is a rerun of an election that took place and that was uh, nullified by the courts. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they act in accordance with what the court provisions came, f uh, came forward with? I think obviously there's multiple actors here in terms of why they haven't acted. The one is the African Union. The one is the Kenyan authorities within themselves, right? Because for me, from an African Union perspective, there's a number of geopolitical issues that arise in Kenya. And the one issue is the instability in the Horn of Africa, there with Somalia and so on, that it's very important for Kenya to be a stable country and to be prosperous to that extent. I think the other issue also is setting up a precedent of uh, I suppose supporting the rule of law in countries because as you've seen that it was the Supreme Court that nullified that thing so you need sort of like some force that actually says no as a continent this is what we stand for we, we pro rule of law and we pro uh, democracy and so on I think within the country for me the one person that I criticize severely and I'm not very happy with this approach is Raila Odinga with him pulling out of the rerun because I think what that does is that it institutionalizes apathy into the electorate and by that I mean that it doesn't really matter whether or not you uh, like the choices that you've been given in terms of electoral candidates. I mean, it's the same issue of uh, Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. You don't have to like Hillary, you don't have to like Donald Trump, but at the end of the day, the reality is that one of them is going to be president. In the same uh, case in Kenya, you don't have to like uh, Kenya, you don't have to like Odinga. The reality is that one of them has to get chosen to be president, and the president, because of the institutional power that they hold over the country, they make certain decisions that impact people. So once you take decisions which demobilizes people and institutionalizes a culture of apathy, what then you find is that you have a breakdown of governance, and for me, that is the thing, the big consequence that I'm worried for for Kenya is that what's going to happen 
happen with the next election? Has Raila Odinga conceded defeat? Not at all. In fact, he indicated that he doesn't recognize uh, the president-elect, and obvious he's not going to recognize or accept the incoming uh, administration. And But he has got 10 days to lodge the appeal. Tomorrow it's the last day. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't go to the Supreme Court, it means uh, uh, inauguration will definitely happen towards mm -hmm. end of the month or early December. Therefore, we're waiting tomorrow to see whether there will be any movement because as the former South African president, Thabo Mbeki, has indicated as head of the mm -hmm. AU mission and the uh, Commonwealth have indicated that uh, whoever is aggressive must go to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court has demonstrated its independence. And mm -hmm. that's one of the hot spots. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also Liberia mm -hmm. and there's also uh, developments in, Mo in uh, Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. I almost said in Mugabe, but in <laughs> Zimbabwe. Uh, so, so, so let's start with mm -hmm. Liberia. Sophie. Mm -hmm. Yes, Liberia, the court has decided that uh, the rerun shouldn't happen. It was supposed to happen very soon, mm -hmm. but uh, they are still dealing with issues of complaints around the issue of fraud and irregularities. Mm -hmm. So we're waiting. It looks like uh, perhaps uh, after some time the matter will be resolved, but mm -hmm. there are two front runners, and perhaps of interest is George Ware, the former soccer star. Mm. Indeed. Yes. I think for me it's very interesting because even if you take it back to the time when George Weah was running against Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, George Weah, he won in the initial uh, first round but didn't get the required 50% and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was behind. And they had the rerun and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf came and surpassed him. So it's a similar situation in this case is that George Weah is running against now the vice president, the current vice president, Joseph Bokai. And in that sense also George Weah has beaten him. So it will be very interesting to see actually whether or not when they do have that rerun, it, it's not a complete reversal where you have Joseph Bokai now coming up and being the actual president. But the only difference now is that previously George Weah was sort of like running on this populist uh, mandate where he hadn't really had any political experience, but subsequently he has been elected to a Senate, so perhaps his fortunes might change to that extent. So, but in terms of the general, I think, uh, politics of Liberia and so on, it will be very interesting to see whether or not they can also follow up on court processes, because I think this is a new development for the continent, and it's very exciting and interesting that actually people are listening to dictates of courts and and rule of law. Which is critical. Yeah. Sophie, uh, the latest developments in uh, Zimbabwe? Mm -hmm. Yes, yesterday at the rally in Bulawayo, uh, Grace Mugabe, who is also the leader of the Women's League uh, with ZANU PF, and also the First Lady was booed. And that didn't sit well with President Mugabe, who even uh, lambasted his Vice President Emerson Mnangagwa mm -hmm. after Grace herself uh, lambasted Mnangagwa. And President Mugabe giving an indication that he is going to reshuffle his cabinet, but mm -hmm. uh, saying perhaps he is going to do that as soon as they are done with the special elective conference in December, which was called because of the divisions within the party. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we'll see. And Grace Mugabe for the first time making it clear mm -hmm. that she wants to be the vice president. Is she already the de facto president? I mean, obviously, I think Mugabe's administrative capacities have been diminished somewhat because he's very old, and I don't think some of the details is really that much into them. But if he does reshuffle Mnangagwa, I think it would be a very interesting prospect because Mnangagwa has been there with Mugabe since the beginning, and he's very much uh, tainted with the notion that he's the one that led the 5th Brigade during the Kukurahundi, where it was said that the Shona sort of like... Uh, Zimbabwean forces uh, geno led a genocide against the Matebele people. So I've seen like also on Twitter like this Jonathan Moyo who's also like from the south. I mean they're very much opposed to having Nagawa rising and becoming Zimbabwean president. So it will be very interesting to see whether or not in Zimbabwe that doesn't lead to some sort of split between because there's also ethnic tensions there between Shonas and Matebele people. The men to watch the mm -hmm. Sekeremai, Dr. Sekeremai. Mm. And of course, I'm sure we'll get more time to talk about mm -hmm. that. But uh, for the week ahead, uh, Melo, what do you think are going to be the big stories? I don't know. The ANC usually seems to come up in the stories. But I think the Stanley Jordan story obviously is going to play itself out and we'll be hearing more about that. Sophie, what do you think? Well, I think Zimbabwe mm -hmm. and the ANC will continue to dominate the news. But also mm -hmm. Jack Paul's book. Mm -hmm. Indeed, especially given the latest developments. And uh, yes, uh, apparently there are some pirate copies of that book doing the rounds. Uh, I've, uh, I've read it. Have you read it? Not at all, but you know, Twitter comes handy all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, mm -hmm. it is all of that. It is very explosive. Okay. Um, and uh, you actually feel, uh, feel like you're reading something you shouldn't be reading. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens, whether there will be uh, reprints and uh, more sales of that particular book. Mm -hmm. I promised you that uh, very short joke about Orlando Pirates. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And uh, there was a child, of course, uh, who uh, went to the courts and he says he doesn't want to live with his parents because they beat him. Mm -hmm. And they asked him, so who do you want to live with? And he says, I want to live with Orlando Pirates. They don't beat anybody. Oh. Well, uh, thank you so much for watching the show, Media Monitor, today. And we hope that you will join us again at the same time next week for another riveting edition of this very show. And thanks to the rest of the team. Good day and God bless. Live Saturday and Sundays at 8 30 p.m. Are you about that trending life? The looking good and all that slage? Well, fear not, because Trends has all the fashion do's and don'ts for you to stay on point this upcoming season. This film will be an immersive spectacle. You got Kong that's 100 feet tall. It tells this incredible story of man versus nature. The iconic stage production by Mbongeni Ngema is back with a bang. Sarafina is a classic South African production. I always choose to align myself with brands that I just love. Because when you love something, it, it, it doesn't become work. Uh, luxury is not built overnight, but it's an experience that comes with time. Catch up with all the trends on Trends Saturdays at 12. Lindy Wenonneba Sisulu was educated in Swaziland and in Canada. She was tortured in detention during apartheid for having banned ANC material. Lindy worked as a lecturer at the Manzini Teachers Training College in the mid-1980s. She joined the MK in exile and was intelligent operative. During 1990, when she returned to South Africa, she worked as President Jacob Zuma's PA. As we are gathered here today, nourishing the fruits of liberation, we recognize that some of our gallant men and women with whom we fought in the deep, ugly trenches of war are not here. She held numerous parliamentary positions since 1994, including Minister of Intelligence, Deputy Minister of Home Affairs, Minister of Public Service and Administration, Minister of Defence and Military Veterans, and member of the ANC's National Executive Committee. Lindiwe was awarded Human Rights Centre Fellowship in Geneva in 1992, Presidential Award for Housing Delivery by the Institute for Housing of South Africa in 2004, and International Association for Housing Science Award in 2005. Lindiwe is the current Minister of Human Settlement. Viva! It is a must. I, Lindiwe Sisulu, have committed myself to these principles. We must stop corruption. It is alien to our movement and it is harming us. We must unshackle ourselves from the stronghold of undemocratic processes. The ANC is not for sale. So for heaven's sake, don't let anybody buy your vote. And don't you 
by anybody's vote. It's a must. Designed for British summer and inspired by the airy coming feeling of a dream, the work of Bukinabi architect Francis Gary stands on the lawns of London's Serpentine Gallery. This pavilion is the first by an architect from the African continent and one of the highest honors for any career in design. Visitors are surprised to see that the trunk is bright blue. Carol explains that the indigo blue is the color for special celebrations back in his home country, Burkina Faso, and fitting of this particular occasion. I choose blue. Blue is something meaningful to me in my, 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 my country. Uh, indigo blue is a, is a natural color that we could get, and that is the color for people to when you go to a big celebration. That is what you wear, and I wanted to dress with my best color, being awarded to do the Serpentine Pavilion. It's the highest um, commission in my career, and I wanted just to come and show me with my, with my best clothes, and that is blue. Each year, the Serpentine selects an architect who has never built anything in England to take on the high-profile job of creating a temporary structure that fits with the surroundings and is highly original. For this work, Kerry says he chose the tree as a symbol of community, a place where people gather together. The roof or canopy turns golden in the sunlight. The roof is very inspired by the canopy of the tree, uh, using a wooden structure stained again in a gold. Gold is so important. So let's say yellow, but gold. I wanted it to be warm. I wanted the light to go through and shine over that blue and over the people that will use it. So to create a shelter, a sort of shelter that protect you, protect you without closing you off from the outside world. Kerry first came to public attention when he won the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2004 for